format will be the speaker will speak for a half hour, correct? And you will be, you will be able to have a half hour of Q&A questions and answers directed at the speaker. Remember, this time, not directed at me, but at our guest speaker. Now, the topic for uh, this evening's lecture is can New York State be reformed? How? And the speaker has been involved in reforming New York State, oh, for a long, long time. Ever since I was in the New York State Senate and before I left it to come to Wagner College. Now, his name is Dick Dady. And you have to ask the question, why someone with the name Dick Dady is not participating in the St. Patrick's Day Parade? <laughs> and he's wearing pink, too, not, not green. <laughs> right. Uh, because he thinks this is important. And the commitment was made a year ago, I believe. A year and a half. A year and a half ago that he would be here speaking. Uh, Dick Dady comes to us with an impressive resume that I won't read in total, but just the first paragraph and a few more words after that. Dick Dady is currently the executive director of the Citizens Union and Citizens Union Foundation, interrelating organizations working since 1897 and 1948, respectively. You remember those days in 48 when you entered the elementary school. In pursuit of good government and political reform in New York State and in New York City. He became the executive director of the organization Citizens Union in 2004 while I was still in the state senate and his reputation has increased greatly since he was in his freshman year as the executive director of the Citizens Union. He, um, the Citizens Union is basically a watchdog committee looking at what Albany does legislative branch of government, the executive branch of government, even the judicial branch of government. Recently, since last year, he has worked very closely with former Mayor Koch, who established an organization called New York Uprising. And um, he is constantly traveling between New York and Albany and speaking engagements at college campuses such as at Wagner and before other organizations. And just as we at the U. L. Carey Institute for uh, Reforming Government had a major um, fundraiser last night, the citizen, he also has to have that for the Citizens Union. Because I don't think any of your money comes from the state or the city. Not a penny. Okay. If it did, then we could uh, also request the same thing for us. Well, that would be a conflict. <laughs> that would be a conflict of interest, <laughs> right. Now, um, in introducing uh, Mr. Dating and his topic, I just want to say a few more things. A famous and well-known Protestant theologian during World War II wrote that what Tom Brokaw calls the last great war, World War II, was a war between the forces of good and evil, a war between the forces of light and darkness. Unfortunately, Albany has descended into a pit where you could call what is happening today a battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. 
as a result of the increase in corruption over the years and the decrease in civility that has, had existed uh, when my book, uh, The Man Who Saved New York, You Carry, was written. <coughs> it's unbelievable. And it's unbelievable to the point, and I mentioned this to some of you here today in my class, or my class, that in the last 12 years, the first six years, four legislators were indicted, found guilty, sent to jail, or was a misdemeanor, uh, had to do public service work. In the last six, last six years, 15 legislators have been indicted, found guilty, gone to jail, left jail, and some have died in jail. And there are two more that will probably shortly be indicted. So this is a very important pressing topic between the forces of light and the forces of darkness in our state capital, which impacts the entire state of New York. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you someone who will attempt to eliminate the darkness and bring the light to bear on this topic. Dick Dady. That's a tall <laughs> Thank you, Albany would be a lot lighter and brighter if you were still there. Uh, we, we miss your service. You were definitely, when you were there, uh, you know, a shining light uh, and, a, and, a, and an example of what public service really should be about. Thank you. So, and thank you for coming inside on this beautiful spring day, uh, particularly on St. Patrick's Day. Although some of you look like you are either have celebrated or continuing to celebrate. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I'll try not to keep you too long. Um, but again, thank you for those very kind words and thank you for coming out today on uh, probably our most uh, beautiful spring day so far. Uh, so the topic today is can New York ever be reformed? And if so, how? I believe that we can and we're at a critical juncture in the history of our state to be able to accomplish that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of play where we are in that effort to reform our state government. But before I do, I just want to ask who, who among you have been to Albany? Oh, not really that, wow, only like a handful. Um, it's, it's an amazing place. It's like uh, a place that you've never been to before. You cannot imagine. You have this impression, you know, the state capital, the state government, uh, $130 billion budget. Uh, but it is so uh, dysfunctional uh, and at times uh, corrupt uh, that it really does not serve the public interest. It's really a, a, a place where the special interests rule, uh, whether it be the unions, whether it be the labor, whether it be and labor and uh, businesses and uh, people not necessarily interested in trying to find the common ground necessary to advance the public interest. I'm going to talk the state of play uh, in Albany today. I'm going to focus on four major uh, issues: elections, ethics, redistricting, and campaign finance. One of the reasons that we have the culture of corruption in Albany and that our New York State government has been described as being dysfunctional is because of the way in which our elections are run. When I came over here today from the ferry and the, uh, the, the gentleman, John, who uh, staffs the shuttle, uh, uh, asked me what I was doing here and I told him, um, he told me how fed up he was with the uh, state government. And in fact, uh, said, you know, I was gonna go in to the voting booth this past fall and vote them all out. I was gonna vote against all the incumbents that were running for the state legislature. And he goes, I was really upset when I got into the voting booth and found that I couldn't vote against the incumbent. Why? There were no challengers. No one was challenging the incumbent. It was a foregone conclusion that the current office holders were going to be reelected. And that really was quite annoying to him. Uh, and he says, what's, what's the use? You know, how can, how can you change government? if you don't have a choice at the ballot box. And that's one of the things that we as New Yorkers face, is the fact that we do not have competitive elections here in New York State. And why is that? 
one of the biggest reasons is we have 212 uh, legislators. Uh, how many, you know, how people know how big our New York State Assembly is? How many people in, how many people in the New York State Assembly? And how many in the New York State Senate? Anyone know? Uh, take a guess. Actually, <laughs> 150 in the New York State Assembly and 62 in the New York State Senate. And uh, each of those two bodies have two-year terms. Of those 212 people, how many of them were elected in a general election for the very first time? You know, takes place in November. Um, only two-thirds of them. So one-third of them actually got elected in a what is called a special election. When there's a vacancy that occurs uh, in the New York State Legislature, there's a special election to fill that seat. And what happens is there's not a, a primary election that chooses the party nominee, but a, rather the local political parties choose the candidate to put forward. And the way in which the district lines are drawn, it's a foregone conclusion. If, if, if it's a Democratic-leaning district, the Democrat's going to win. And if it's a Republican-leaning district, the Republican's going to win. Why? Because of the way in which the lines are drawn and because of the low voter turnout. Um, so we, we face a lack of competition in New York State, which helps breed this uh, uh, strong, <coughs> high incumbent re-election rate. Um, when an incumbent runs for re-election, uh, I mean, how many, do any people have an idea of what the re-election rate might be for incumbents in New York State, for the state legislature? Anyone want to hazard a guess? What? Less than 50? I wish it was less than 50. But I'm glad you took, uh, 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 tried to answer the question. Anyone else? There is 96% of all legislators, 96% of all legislators who run for re-election. You're shocked. Are you shocked? Yeah, you're shocked. Now you're, I saw your jaw drop. 96%. Uh, and it used to be, up until a couple years ago, 98%. Our elections have got a little bit more competitive. Um, but why is that? A uh, couple of reasons. Uh, ethics. <coughs> we have a horrible system of ethics, oversight, and uh, enforcement in New York State. Uh, as you can, uh, I handed out some uh, graphs um, to, to you all. There was not enough copies. But Citizens Union, uh, earlier this month, or late last month, released a report that showed uh, the reason for the legislative turnover in New York. And we looked at the um, past 12 years uh, and the, examined all the reasons why the legislators left office. And we came upon a very interesting statistic. And that statistic was, you see, the, for those of you who have these two red bar charts, if you don't have it, maybe look to your uh, uh, colleague uh, nearby you. But if you look at the one with the uh, every two-year period, you'll see that the rise that we face in the number of departures because of ethical or criminal misconduct among the legislature. If you look from the, the, <clears throat> the period between 1999 and 2000, you saw that one left. Between 2001 and 2002, nobody left because of ethical misconduct. But all of a sudden, beginning in 2003, you can see that it spikes up and continues upward. If you look at the next one, which analyzes the first six-year period to the second-year period, you will see in that first six-year period, there were four legislators that left because of criminal misconduct or ethical charges. The second six years, there were 13. And essentially, the rate tripled. It's a crime wave of public corruption going on in our state capital. And that doesn't even include... I just want to say in the last week, the 13 became 15. With what? The, it, 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 will, it will likely become 15 if they leave office because of this. Right. Uh, and that's the way it's uh, looking. But as you can see, we have a horrible culture in Albany where people are leaving more and more because of criminal misconduct and uh, uh, ethical charges. 
So what's, what's going on about this? Um, you know, last year we tried to pass a, a new ethics reform bill. Um, the legislature and the, uh, uh, got together with the good government groups. We negotiated a decent bill. It wasn't the ideal bill. It was, it, we did not create an effective enough independent uh, oversight entity to, um, to make people feel like there was enough uh, bite to it. Uh, but the legislature agreed to it uh, in any event, largely because they felt the need to act. Because when we put that up this report, it kind of crystallized for New Yorkers what was going on. But Governor Patterson vetoed the bill, and we've had to start all over again. Uh, but because of the leadership that's being provided by Governor Cuomo on this issue, I think we will have a very strong ethics bill soon. And so when, when the question is asked, can New York State ever be reformed, I think in the area of ethics we will see that. But what's been the problem with ethics in New York State? The problem has been that the legislature essentially appoints the cops on the beat to watch over them. So imagine a situation where, you know, the very legislators who are committing these crimes or are acting inappropriately are being investigated, evaluated, and judged by their peers. They're not going to turn on one another. And so there's not enough independence to the system to be able to, you know, bring about the kind of true ethics reform that we really want. Senator uh, Kruger and uh, Assemblyman Boylan, their charges, their public corruption charges, their bribery, was not uncovered by the legislature, but it was uncovered by the U.S. Attorney's Office. So there's no real effective self-policing that goes on, which is why we need an independent ethics oversight uh, agency within the state legislature, and I think we're going to get it. The other thing is, is that a lot of the legislators are part-time, serving in the legislature is a part-time job. You are not prohibited from earning outside income. And so there are many lawyers in the legislature. We love lawyers. They help to add to the thinking through and the consideration of these pieces of legislation. But they are also allowed to earn outside income. But we don't know what conflicts may exist. In, uh, in the clients that they serve at the law firm. Are the clients that come to the law firm, do they also do business with New York State? What, what do you think is the conflict there? Can anybody identify the conflict of, no, yes? The, can you imagine you know, a legislator who's trying to decide on a piece of legislation, <clears throat> who's a lawyer, and has clients who have business before the state, and so the businesses who have business before the state and may be affected by the legislation would actually come to the, to the, to the lawyer, to the legislator lawyer's law firm and retain the legislator as a way in which to make sure that they have the ear of the legislator. So one of the things that we're hoping and we'll, and we'll hopefully see is that we'll have an independent, independent and effective ethics oversight and enforcement. The other problem in Albany is called gerrymandering. Do people know what gerrymandering is? Yes? No? Anybody? Raise any, your hand. Have you ever heard? You know it? Is. It's like the same thing as reapportionment, right? Where, Perfect. Yeah, yeah where um, well, the legislator goes in and they redistrict areas based on population, but usually it's, it's kind of a corrupt system because it's controlled by the Republican or Democrat, and they're going to try to redistrict the areas based upon However, the legislature is not area to uh, for to, to rewin elections and and basically override elections. Yeah, you should come down here and actually give <laughs> that was a very good answer. Um, but yeah, gerrymandering is the process by which the legislative district lines are drawn every ten years based on the census results. Now we just completed a census. The results are going to be announced. They, they've been announced by state, and the actual. Uh, localities or you know how big New York City is and how small the city of Syracuse is going to be announced on April 1. So we'll have a much better sense of how the population of the New York State of, of, of the United States uh, is apportioned all throughout the country. Um, and so we're going to start redrawing the districts to make sure that we come to this you know representation of one person one vote as much as possible. But the responsibility for drawing those lines fall with the state legislature. And this is part of the problem in not having competitive elections, is that the legislators, in drawing these lines, 
essentially choose their voters before the voters choose them. So they go in and they think, you know, we'll, we'll rig this district that will ensure that I get reelected and that I stifle competition. Case in point, out here in Brooklyn, there's a gentleman, uh, there, was a, there was a state assembly member called Roger Green, who in 2000 ran for re-election and he faced a challenger. And the challenger was a guy by the name of Hakeem Jeffries. Hakeem Jeffries came in a Democratic Party primary, came within eight percentage points of beating Roger Green. That was one of the more competitive elections that we've ever seen in New York State. I shouldn't say ever seen. It was one of the more competitive elections that year in New York State. So that was in 2000. Between 2000 and 2002, the lines are redrawn. Now, Hakeem had every intention of running against Roger Green again in the hope that he could beat him the second time out in 2002. What do you think happened? Any guesses? The legislature, in drawing the lines, just happened to, you know, carve out the block where Hakeem Jeffries' house was so he could not run against Roger Green in 2002. That's called gerrymandering the political manipulation of the district lines for partisan or political advantage. So you essentially have, you know, again, the legislators are choosing their voters in drawing up these districts before the voters actually choose them. One of the things that we're trying to do is create an independent process to this redistricting effort. Essentially taking it out of the hands of the legislators and placing it into the hands of an independent body to do that. It's called independent redistricting reform. The process began in 2005 with then, then Assembly Member Mike Gianaris from Queens. He's now represents a state Senate district, uh, having been elected in 2010. Then Governor Elliot Spitzer campaigned on this issue, got elected in 2006, put together a constitutional amendment that essentially would change the process. Uh, of course, we all know what happened to, you know, Elliot Spitzer, or you, you do know what happened to Elliot Spitzer, right? Uh, um, so, uh, and that effort died. But we've been able to revitalize the effort over the last year or two uh, with the support of <coughs> Governor Cuomo and the help of Ed Koch and his New York Uprising group in trying to create an independent redistricting commission. Right now, the state constitution allows for, gives the, gives the legislature the sole authority to draw these district lines. What we want to try and do is set up an independent commission similar to the ones, to the, to the way in which the uh, National uh, Military Base Closing Commission works. Do people, are people familiar with that? Where they, you know, the Congress essentially delegates its authority to decide which military bases are to be closed, and then this commission recommends uh, to the Congress what, what um, uh, military bases should be closed because it's so, uh, fraught with, you know, personal interest, trying to protect your district. Uh, and so the decisions are not always based on merit in making those kind of decisions on which basis to close. So we're trying to set it up in a very similar way, that the legislature would create a commission that would be impartial, independent, politically balanced to draw these lines and make recommendations to the legislature that has to approve the legislation. The one thing that we, and the legislature has been very, very resistant to this. And the ace in the hole that we have is that Governor Cuomo has threatened to veto the lines that are drawn by the legislature. The lines have to be drawn, in, new lines have to be drawn in time for the 2012 election. If they are not, uh, they have to be. They just, the law requires that in order for the new districts and for the, the candidates to run in these new districts. If um, the legislature draw these line, draws these lines, Cuomo has said he's going to be to them. So he's going to essentially force to the table the legislature to come up with an independent process and remove the conflict of interest that exists when the self-interested legislators have always drawn these lines. You can see um, in another chart the pie charts, the green pie charts uh, that were distributed. The, the record level of support that we've been able to get in the New York State Legislature 
for an independent redistricting commission. You can see the, uh, you know, there's one that says 121 supporters in the New York State Assembly, and the other one says 60 supporters in the New York State Senate. That's a record level of support. However, we're not so certain that we're actually going to be able to get this through. And why is that? Um, because legislators often take positions on public issues that they know they need to take, and they're, they're protected by the legislative leaders. Um, you know, I'd love to get this bill out on the floor for a vote. Would love to be able to reform and change Albany, um, but we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Uh, we hope that, however, we're going to be able to change this uh, because the governor has made this promise to veto any lines drawn by legislators. Let me just pause there for a minute and ask for any questions on that, on the issue of gerrymandering. No? Okay. Uh, the other issue that comes into play here in New York State is campaign finance reform. Um, right now, all the elections in New York State are financed through private contributions that are made to the, to the, uh, to the candidates. Uh, what we'd like to see happen in New York uh, is for there to be uh, reform in that area as well, to, for there to be a public financing system of elections. Uh, does anybody know what that means when I say public financing of elections? No? I know you guys want to get outside. Um, <laughs> such a beautiful day. The, the, the public financing of elections involves the government essentially giving money, public money, to candidates. Now, why would you do that? Why would, what, what's, what's the public interest in having the government give public money to candidates running for election? Yes. So politicians don't have to take from other facets to uh, fund their own campaigns, whereas they would just tax the public for essentially voting for them, so it would make more sense. Yeah, you, you, you know, exactly. The, the um, candidates have to go out and raise money in order to run their campaigns. And so when you go and talk to donors, and the donors may be of special interest groups, um, people don't turn over money necessarily without some expectation of access to the candidate should they win or support for a particular issue. And so there's a lot of money goes into, the, into these campaigns and it becomes almost a transactional business, right? I'll give you money if you will vote this way or I hope you'll vote for this way. And it makes it very difficult for candidates that, you know, in asking for the money, uh, there almost becomes this silent quid pro quo. And so one of the ways we try and get around it is to create a public financing system. The other problem is that because of the because in, when incumbents run for re-election, they are in office and they can do a great deal of they, they have a great advantage in going to those special interests and individual donors because they're already in that office. And so a lot of money flows to the incumbents, and less money flows to the challengers. And as we all know, if you have more money when you're running for office, you're going to have more, more of an effective way to communicate and have greater voter contact. And so to try and level the playing field, to help the challengers wage effective campaigns against well-entrenched, well-financed incumbents, we support a public financing system. We have one here in New York City where uh, if you raise, you know, Let's, say, let's take the issue of, um, um, if you're running for city council, if you raise like maybe $85,000, you get another $85,000 from the city government on a matching basis. So the more private funds you raise, the more money you're able to get from the city. Now it's capped out at one hundred sixty-five dollars or $170,000, um, but it helps to level the playing field. We'd like to be able to see that in New York State as well. We also would like to see greater disclosure because a lot of these campaign contributions, a lot of the expenses, uh, while they're put on file, it's very difficult to organize, to go through them, to, to kind of have the, this, the, the, the ability to evaluate the way in which these candidates are receiving and expending money. And also the law is written in such a vague way that elected officials often use these campaign accounts not necessarily to run for office, but to finance their lifestyle. Because there's not much of a ban on personal use. 
you know, are people familiar with Joe Bruno, who was the former Senate Majority Leader that was indicted? Um, raised millions and millions of dollars. One of the funny things is that he uh, had as a campaign expense a hardtop pool cover for his pool at home because he f argued that he needed to have that in order to hold campaign events at his home. Can you imagine that? So we have campaign finance reform. We have the need to end independent, or excuse me, the need to end partisan gerrymandering and try and create an independent redistricting commission, as well as to have independent and effective ethics oversight and enforcement in order to uh, bring to justice those that are not, like we saw last week with Carl Kruger and William Boylan, to bring to, you know, to, if, if, let me just, if you have someone watching over you, you're going to be much more cautious about how you act. The problem with Albany is that nobody is serving as an effective watchdog. There's not really a cop on the beat, so to speak, or an effective cop on the beat. So if no one's really watching you, you're more prone to acting out or to saying, well, no one's really paying attention, so you know, I can get into doing this, with this on this issue with this client, with this voter, for this particular and personal gain, which is why we need effective independent ethics oversight. Um, and then elections. We need to change the way in which our elections are run. Uh, too often, the, as we said, the, the elections are not very competitive. Those who fill these vacancies that create, that are created during the middle of the term, are appointed to the position by the Democratic or the Republican Party leaders. They run in these special elections with only two or three percent turnout. And then when they run for re-election, uh, they're running as an incumbent with all the advantages of being an incumbent. So it's those four things, elections, ethics reform, independent redistricting, and campaign finance reform that we believe will help New York State become a more effective, more efficient government, one that is accountable to the, New York, to, to the people of this state, and one that is fair and operates not just in response to the special interests, but rather in the, in the large public interest. We want to be sensitive to the time. We've, it's 5.40. I want to take some questions. When you uh, raise your hand and ask a question, give us your name, because you're being recorded for posterity. Go ahead. Uh, Kevin Farrell, as far as like a, a private and like investigation uh, that would go that would involve ethics and finance reform, elections, all that, um, would that need to be uh, like passed by the legislator, or would that be something that would go through the citizens' union and you guys would fund that uh, yourselves and release those findings somehow? Uh, it would have to be. It would have to be uh, through the legislature. Okay. Uh, the proposal right now that's on the table with the legislature is that um, there would be a new ethics commission that would have uh, responsibility for conducting investigations of not just the executive branch but also the legislative branch. Because okay. right now the, the current system allows for the legislature to conduct its own investigations. Okay. So the law would. Uh, provide for this independent body. And how would it be independent? No one elected official would control a majority of the appointments. So you've got gubernatorial appointments, you've got legislative appointments, you know, 15, a body of 15 possibly uh, people serving together to serve as an, uh, uh, as an oversight entity with staff to conduct the investigation. Uh, just to so, uh, open up, um, wouldn't that, like, I know that's going to be quite hard to get past considering that the people that are going to be being watched over are going to pass this bill, do you feel like the chance of this bill being passed would be, what, what, what the likelihood would be? Well, what's interesting is that um, I think we're very close to this. You know, Governor Cuomo's made it a priority. It was something that the legislature passed last year. Uh, you know, the ideal bill uh, is, you know, I, I, the ideal bill that we wanted last year, we got about 65% of it. Uh, given where the state of play is right now with the negotiations that are going on, I would say we're probably going to get 80 or 85 percent of it because the legislature wants to be able to go out and say we are listening to our voters, we are changing Albany, we are bringing about the reforms that you have asked us to do. Um, and with you know, things like Carl Kruger and Boylan last week and with this 
you know, crime wave, as we've called it, of public corruption increasing, good legislators, and there are a lot of good legislators out there, are embarrassed because they're being painted with the same broad brush as the crooks. And so they want to say, we've got to do a better job of policing ourselves because my own individual credibility, my integrity is being uh, compromised as a result of these others. And so there's an incentive for the good legislators, of which there's an overwhelming majority of them, uh, to uh, pass this legislation. Okay. Yes. Name, please. Um, my name is Jacinta Lawrence, and I agree with you. I do think that there needs to be an independent check on um, legislation. But um, I agree with Mr. Farrell here. I'm a tad bit concerned, even though you voiced that there is um, a, a large percentage or a group of honest legislators, if they're supposed to be the one who is going to approve it. I just think that that kind of contaminates it being independent um, because the check is on them. You know? Yeah, it's a very good point. The, um, the, 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 the current rub right now um, where we would like to see a change, and I don't think we're going to succeed, is that there will be independence in the investigation of you know, the allegation. But the decision to sanction and to punish the legislature, legislator will still rest with the legislator, legislature, <coughs> the ethics committee. We'd like to have it be a completely independent body uh, and the legislature not sit in judgment of one another. But, our, but the legislature will not give that up. They believe that they, they still want legislators sitting in judgment of other legislators as they determine the punishment and the sanctions. Now, if it's a criminal, I mean, I want to be very clear. If it's a criminal charge, it still goes to the DA. It still goes to the U.S. Attorney. Um, but in terms of, you know, ethical violations in the, in the, in the, in the, in the public officer's wall, uh, as long as they're not criminal in nature, will be handled by this independent body, but, and they will make a report saying, we find, you know, Senator so-and-so has, uh, 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 they won't find him guilty, but there's enough findings of fact to support that this allegation is in fact true. And we recommend that the legislature sanction this particular legislator. The legislature will still have that responsibility. Our hope is that when there's, this report is made public on an individual legis legislator's misbehavior, that there will be enough public pressure for them to act. I mean, are everyone's familiar with uh, what happened with Charlie Rangel in Congress, right? Um, it would be a similar operation. There was an independent entity that did the investigation or recommended to the Ethics Committee in Congress, and they essentially sat in judgment of, of Charlie Rangel. Now, he should have gotten maybe nailed more than he did, because all he got was a censure. But it was a pretty uh, public uh, rebuke. Yes? Wouldn't you say that this is long, just into Lawrence, wouldn't you say that this is long overdue? You know, that like there should have been, there been an independent investigation. I mean, I understand that they're not going to pass anything when they still don't have a say in what's going on. But even in our judicial court system, every part, you, when you, you cannot be a part of that. You know, it's, it's a conflict of interest. When you do things behind closed doors with money and extortion and stuff, you do it in secret, you know, you don't want to be a part of it. And I think one of the reasons why these things continue to keep on happening, even with Kruger, is because he, I mean, he has money, you know, and they, they keep on getting off on it. And it it's, it's, looks very bad for our nation and for our country. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Amy Wallach, uh, I don't know if you think this is a silly question, but do you no think question that, is silly. Oh, okay, good. Um, do you think it's possible that the rise in unethical legislatures is just like them getting caught instead of like? It's a very good question. Um, the uh, um, I think that the enforcement. Uh, has been more aggressive and better by outside entities, the district attorney or the U.S. you know the U.S. attorney, um, but and so they're getting caught, uh, and there's a lot that goes on that we don't know about. 
Uh, but the, the, I, I do believe that um, the reason they're getting caught is because there's more, more crime going on. Um, it wasn't as if the prior entities were not, you know, the prior enforcement entities were not doing their job. I just think there is more crime going on. Yes. Um, Kevin okay. Farrell, once again, uh, as far as the legis uh, legislators appointing like law enforcement officials, would this bill also um, include uh, independents um, selecting law enforcement officials in New York State, or is that something that is just inevitable? Say, say, state that again. Uh, well, you're, you're, you're talking about how the legislator appoints the like law enforcement officials, like cops, that are essentially the ones responsible for persecuting them. Um, would would the bill include anything that would be able to control that? Yes. Um, you know, right now, um, you know, there's a in the on, on the ethics oversight within the legislature. There's an ethics committee. Okay. The ethics committee is comprised of legislators. Right? The legislators have a staff. Uh, the, excuse me, the Legislative Ethics Com Committee has a staff. The staff is not protected at all. Uh, one of the provisions in the new law will be that the executive director of the uh, committee will be have a three or five year fixed term. So they cannot be removed. So they're, remo you know, they're, they're protected mm -hmm. from harassment and intimidation. Because right now, you know, you act against them in a way that they don't like, they'll kick you out of your job. Yeah. So there, there's going to be some independence at the staff level that will give them that kind of protection. Yes? Uh, um, what, I'd like to know like, what kind of protection. Like, I'd like to know two things. I'd like to know, one, who, um, who does the ethics committee, who do they have to A, answer to? And what's to stop this corruption from infiltrating? The committee on its own. I mean, you mentioned staffing, but specifically, I mean, it's so uh, affluent. Sure. Um, well, it gets it gets back to this um, idea that if you create an entity that is charged with the investigation uh, of criminal misconduct or ethical uh, uh, charges, that if no one elected official controls the uh, body, so if it's a 15-member commission, and you know. Uh, five are controlled by the governor, and you know uh, the, the remaining ten are controlled by the minority leader in the assembly, and, and then the speaker in the assembly. So, you know, there will, there will be an incentive to watch out on the other, for the other guy, right? And so there's, you know, um, no one will be able to like direct their appoint, appointees or control a majority of the appointees. So there's that, you know, that synergy that. You know, independence that comes from the commission being made up of separate factions, uh, with no one being able to control a majority. Um, and what was your second part of the question? Um, who, who would the ethics committee answer to? I mean, they would just be a separate entity, or would they have somebody they don't have to? There would be a separate entity. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there would be a, a board, right? And the board, and, and there would one of the requirements of the commission would be could not be a. a, a, a Current elected official or a lobbyist, or you haven't worked for, uh, for the government for two years or more, uh, you know. So there'd be right now, you know, some of the in the in the legislature right now, the legislative ethics commission, legislators serve on. So that would be another uh, way in which the independence could be achieved. Is you would not have legislators in the independence in, in the investigation phase being responsible for that. The problem is, is that legislators are going to sit in judgment of other legislators. Yeah. Yes. Can we have your name, please? Right. We're going to have to stop in about five minutes. I don't. Know. Some of you have six o'clock classes. Go ahead. Do other states have voters in place already? Yeah. New York State has a horrible system, uh, and there are far better systems in other states uh, where you, you you do have you know completely independent ethics commission uh, that has not just the responsibility for the investigation phase. But also a responsibility for the enforcement, uh, and there's no, you know, while the elected officials may make the appointments of the various people that serve on this ethics commission, um, they uh, are in, they are independent at the investigation and the sanctioning stage. I and mean, we just have a horrible, horrible system. Yes. 
And we're still not, we're still not going to have the best system even after this reform. Yes. One last question. Uh, what about conflict, Michael Wismer? Uh, what about conflict of interest? So if you, uh, like you can see it sometimes with the Supreme Court, if they uh, were, in, you know, uh, were involved in a decision, they will recuse, exclude themselves from it. So why not in the same thing? Like a legislator uh, in his private life will introduce legislation that might benefit him, like he was saying. Right. Uh, it's a very good question. The other component of ethics reform is disclosure. Um, right now, legislators and elected officials and senior public officials within the government have to file a, a, a disclosure form uh, revealing any potential conflicts of interest. And where those conflicts of interest are often, you know, what kind of business affairs are they involved in, what kind of clients they have, if they are lawyers. Uh, a lot of that right now is private. Um, and is not all that available, and, and that which it is available is red acted or blacked out, right? And so the new ethics law would require far greater public disclosure. There's already disclosure going on, but it's to the very people that, you know, make up part of the problem. And so the public will have a greater opportunity to look at uh, uh, the kinds of conflicts that may exist through greater public disclosure that's going to be required under the law. Okay. Uh, just about a few minutes before six, and I want to particularly thank uh, Mr. Dady for taking several hours off. <laughs> he has explained and elucidated a very difficult topic. And uh, if Mr. Dady were to give to me, um, the report of the Citizens uh, Union and the report of the um, New York Uprising dealing with ethics reform, I will commit myself and promise that I will give you copies of it once it arrives. Now, we have all their names, Alex, upstairs, don't we? Everyone who came here? If not, if you want to get copies of this report, uh, we will have, this is your original report. Yes, yeah, it's original. You can go to citizensunion.org, citizens with an S, union.org, or reshapenewyork.org, which is this campaign that we are running to bring about independent redistricting. A lot of these, you know, charts and reports that I've talked about, and a lot of this information that I've tried to consolidate into a very little bit, a very little amount of time, is available on the website. If you want to dig deeper, there's all kinds of information about that. And it'll explain all the legislation that's going on and all the various options that are on the table. Okay, again, many thanks, and I thank the audience for taking thank you an hour off of being here. Happy St. Patrick's Day.